Hello, it's Ranger Melissa. Happy Glacier Science Day. We are here in one of my favorite places in Glacier National Park. We are on the trail to Pegan Pass. And not only is this one of my favorite areas, but we are going to learn about one of my favorite alpine critters, the American pika. And in just a minute, we're gonna meet up with biologist and citizen science program manager, Jamie Belt. She's gonna tell us all about the pika. Before we do, I just wanna tell you that it's, we're about at 7,000 feet in elevation, and it's about 63 degrees Fahrenheit right now. Um, mostly sunny today, a beautiful day actually to be up here. And around me, you're gonna see some, um, lots of different forbs, different wildflowers. Some are yellow, some are white. Um, we have glacier lilies right here. And then there's some subalpine fir, which are pretty short, and they are so short because we're actually heading into the alpine. And once we get to the alpine, we're not gonna see trees anymore. Just really low-lying shrubs and lots of little forbs or wildflowers will be everywhere. So that's where we are today. I'm so excited you can join us and let's go meet Jamie. Okay, we've made it to the talus slopes and whew, it's a little rocky here, folks, but I found Jamie. She's right here. Hey, Jamie. Melissa. How are you? Doing good. Um, I know you're gonna talk to us all about pikas. Yay, pikas today. But um, it, I, it seems like you have something you wanna show us right, no, right off the bat. Yeah, yeah, I got up here to see if I could find evidence that pikas are currently using this site. And I haven't found evidence yet other than I did hear an eep just a few minutes ago. Oh. Over that away, not quite right where we're standing. But I have an okay pile right here underneath oh, cool. this rock that cool. you can see. Oh, I'd love to look at it. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, let's get close. I'll put my mask on. Oh, wow, I see it. That is so cool. You can even see some of the different um, forbs in there. Cool. What we're looking at here is a pika's hay pile from last year. So they spend time starting in the late summer storing vegetation for the following winter so that they have something that they can live off while the snow blankets the earth and all the vegetation is no longer available. And that's a really unique thing for um, an alpine animal. All of the other um, species that would live in the same environment, marmots, uh, ground squirrels, and things like that, all go to sleep sometime right around the end of August, whereas pikas just keep on staying awake. So what we have in here, you can pull out some of the materials. Um, so here's a stalk, dried brown stalk of yarrow that was clipped last year and then stored. Um, not exactly sure what this one is, maybe a penstemon, which is like a purple, light purple flower. There's some grasses. So in these hay piles, they store winter vegetation and they can visit it all winter underneath the snow and keep eating off of it to stay alive. And also as the spring starts to um, emerge and vegetation starts to grow again, it gives them something to keep them meeting their caloric needs before the, the vegetation growth really fires back up. These talus fields, oh my gosh, sorry. I just saw a golden mantled ground squirrel. I got real excited because I saw the movement, but there's one of the species right there. You can see it right now that lives right alongside of the pikas. You can tell a golden mantle ground squirrel from a pika um, because pikas have no tail. They are a rabbit family member or otherwise known as a lagomorph. And so if you look at one, you can see that rounded body. You can picture what they might look like with big long ears like what you're used to seeing with a rabbit. But because they live in these alpine environments, they have a smaller body surface area ratio so that they can stay warmer so that they can kind of regulate their heat better and their ears are short which is helpful for preventing frostbite and um, keeping those temperature extremes from being problematic for them. Pikas rely on this talus habitat because it's where they store their hay piles. It's where they can get under these rocky you know boulder fields into those spaces below the boulders and regulate their temperature and that's really important because pikas have a pretty high resting temperature of 104 
and they can hit lethal temperature range at about 109. So it doesn't take a lot of exposure to hot ambient temperatures before they start to experience temperature stress. Underneath these rocks, you know, the place where we looked at the hay pile underneath this rock here, there's a lot of airspace and cool shade underneath those spaces and they re retain a much more stable temperature than the surface area. So the pikas can go underneath and basically regulate their temperature without having to worry about what the temperature is outside. Those are also really important in the winter then because again their temperature is stable underneath those snowpack, underneath the snow fields where the talus fields are often covered and so it provides an insulative blanket in the winter when they're trying to survive. Okay, so you found some pika scat? Yeah, yeah, under this nice overhang, it's a nice sheltered spot for depositing a lot of poop right there. Oh yeah, I see it. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and grab some of this pika scat for you. I did put a glove on just to take precautions. Um, there is an emerging disease that just showed up in North America from Europe called the rabbit hemorrhagic disease that's been um, affecting domestic and wild rabbits and because pikas are related to rabbits there's believed to be susceptibility in pikas as well so we're on the lookout for that and this is just a good precaution to make sure we're not transporting any possible disease pathogens so here's some of the poop to give you a close-up look so you can see those little peppercorns there oh yes they do they look just like peppercorns yeah and then that white stuff on that is the urine I can just go ahead and show you this right oh, wow. here. So this um, this shows you what that urine looks like. And then this rock here is a spot where they have urinated frequently. So these are often vigilant sites where they hang out here and they kind of monitor their territory and make sure that no other pikas or other species are trying to get in and encroach upon their hay piles or their source of vegetation. Um, and this white urine is a factor of there are not being a lot of water in these talus fields. It's fairly arid right here. So they get water from the vegetation, but in order to conserve water, they concentrate their urine quite a bit and that makes it look white. One really interesting thing about rabbits in general is that they will re-ingest their poop. So the first time it comes out, it's, there's, there's two tracts. There's a cecal tract and a fecal tract and the cecal pellets are longer. Um, and have a lot of undigested protein. And so they can re-ingest those and get more nutrients out of them. And so they'll often re-ingest those immediately, but in some cases they may store them as well. And they've even been seen to utilize poop from other species like marmots. Wow. Yeah. Yum. <laughs> <laughs> we started doing pika research here in Glacier National Park in 2008. And the impetus was that at the time, Concerns had been raised about pika populations that had disappeared in locations further to the south of here, particularly in the lower elevations. And some of the concern was that possibly climate change and the heat stress that that might cause to pikas might be driving that change in population persistence and maybe causing ranges for pikas to shrink. And so there was a lot of interest in learning more about these little alpine rabbits so that we could understand whether they could serve as a sentinel to climate change and what sort of effects they might feel from the things that are changing with climate change. So at the time there was a petition for endangered species listing, but a lot of places realized they didn't have good baseline data on pikas because not a lot of people had been really paying a lot of attention to these little critters before. So various organizations set out to try to fill that gap and learn more about pikas and try to figure out where they are now so that we can see whether or not that actually is changing over time and what sort of things might be driving that change. Okay, so I'm going to set up one of the research plots that we use to collect seven years of baseline data on pika occupancy, so whether or not pikas are present. So I'm going to use this GPS unit to get myself to the spot where I need to go and at that place I'll find a center point with a little pin flag. Okay so here's the center point. I got my pin flag right down here so I'm going to mark it for my visual reference and then I have a cord that will help me measure out a 12 meter radius circle and what that is for is pikas have individual home territories 
that they maintain and defend. And so this roughly approximates one home territory, possible home territory of a pika, so that we can check to see if that specific territory is occupied. So we return to these map locations each year to see if the individual territory that we have mapped continues to be occupied or if it turns over. And so what we're looking for at the site when we get to it is whether there is evidence of fresh sign or other signs of, of current occupancy. So seeing a pika within that territory, finding a fresh hay pile. So a big reason for the concern about pikas and why they may be a good sentinel for the alpine is that they are so unique. They're keystone species in this type of environment. They do a lot of nutrient cycling because of the vegetation that they collect and they collect quite a bit. So those hay piles, if they're not completely consumed in the winter, remain and decay and actually can cause a lot of nutrient flush into the alpine. Um, one of the problems that can happen with climate change is that snowpack becomes less predictable. And so you may have earlier snowpack, which means that they don't get as much time to get the vegetation. But the bigger problem is when the snowpack melts off early in the spring and they don't have that insulative blanket to keep them covered. You may also find some effects with changes in snowpack and how that water flow under the talus field actually keeps the talus much cooler. So you may have some changes in the buffering of the temperatures of the talus. Because they're so specific to this niche, they don't have the ability to necessarily move if things change for them in these talus fields. They can go up to get to where it's a little bit cooler. And in some places that has already been observed that the pikas in lower elevations are retreating and moving to higher areas. But recent research has shown that there is probably an upper elevational limit. And that was one of the things that was found with the study back in 2008, 2009 as well by the PhD student, that there seems to be an upper gradient where they no longer can survive, probably because of extreme temperatures and exposure and not early enough vegetation growth. So the pika needs to be able to stay cool in the summer, but also stay buffered from the cold in the winter. And that's a really important way for them to be able to survive in this harsh environment. Thanks again for joining us for Glacier Science Day. I am so excited to um, have you join us for some of the next science videos that we have. Stay tuned, watch our Facebook premiere scheduling so you know when they are. And we'll have lots more fun this summer and fall with other folks doing science and research in the park. Hey, Jamie, I, there is one question I still want to know. Is, is the pika your favorite alpine critter? Pikas are pretty darn cute. I do love baby mountain goats. They're kind of hard to beat, um, but there's so many fascinating species that have figured out a way to make a living in this incredibly beautiful, but incredibly harsh environment. And so I kind of love them all. Awesome. All right, thanks again, everybody. Have a good Glacier Science Day. Bye.